welcome to Poetic Lines, where writers make the language sing. Today I'm thrilled to welcome Todd Boss to the show. Todd is a tremendously talented poet who has taken the literary world by storm and has achieved more in the past two years than many poets do in a lifetime. I say that because Todd, like his writing, is distinctive, original, and defies expectations. While many poets connect with critics or with general readers, Todd's work delights both groups, which is one reason why his debut collection, Yellow Rocket, was published in 2008 by W.W. W. Norton, the most prestigious publisher in the country. Yellow Rocket spent several weeks on the poetry bestseller list and was released in paperback this past spring. That's the equivalent of a baseball player winning a Cy Young Award and a World Series ring in his first major league season. Accomplishments like that just don't happen. Unless, of course, a poet writes with the boldness, musicality, and wide range that Todd does. His poems can be as tender as a kiss between husband and wife, or as tough as the work he and his family did on the Wisconsin farm where he grew up. Todd writes unflinchingly about the things people cannot say or even name, yet behind every line is a love as tenacious as a weed after which his collection is named. Todd earned his MFA from the University of Alaska, and his poems have appeared in a variety of publications, including The New Yorker, Poetry, and Prairie Schooner. He was Director of External Affairs at the Playwright Center in Minneapolis, where he is now a consultant. He and his family live in St. Paul, Minnesota. Todd, thank you so much for coming. Thanks for having me, Elizabeth. So which poem are you going to read for us? Well, I'll start out with um, a poem about my father called Wood Burning. And, um, it's about uh, growing up on the farm where we had wood heat. That was our primary furnace down in the basement. To my father, a woods is not a woods without a wood pile in it, a brush mess near it where the lesser limbs landed. To my father, season is a verb, a reason not to disturb one chord or another. I swear his veins run bar chain oil. To my father, no carpet is as royal as a sawdust trail in the muddy soil. All that smacks of riches is as air to him compared to the ring of his axe in the hills and the ditches around his shacks and those stacks banked up against a future winter's weather. And before we're awake, He's back at that brick altar, opening the cold and stubborn iron heart of the house, turning the fact of newsprint and tinder into a kind of prayer for our warming, his first tender act of the morning. Oh, that is one of my favorite poems. And I think it's a great example of what your work does because it is so authentic and so, so visual, so palpable. As you read, I could hear and feel <laughs> the words and I could feel the tenderness that mm. he was showing mm. to you. So it's a great way to open. Thanks. It also is a great way for us to talk about your childhood on the farm and mm -hmm. how that may have helped you along your yeah. interesting journey to become a poet. Yeah. So when you think back now, what really stands out? What stands out is the do-it-yourself nature of my childhood. My parents were back to the nature types. They weren't hippies exactly, but they had kind of a, you know, hippie sensibility. They wanted to make their own soap and they wanted to bake their own bread and they wanted to build their own stuff and they wanted to, you know, plow their own driveway. And uh, that sensibility is, I think, a legacy that they left to me. And so I think early on as a kid I learned the, the care and attention that goes into any craft. 
any handmade thing, and the joy that can uh, come from something that you've made yourself. And so I've always um, been drawn to things that I can make, and poetry turned out to be one of those things that I can make and that I get that kind of joy from. So I think they modeled how to make a good thing to me, and it's still with me. Mm -hmm. mm. You obviously learned well, judging you. from your work. They also taught you a few things about taking risks. Would you tell us a little bit about that? When I was six years old, my parents made the mistake of their lives and they risked everything they had and sold their share of the family farm that my father stood to inherit from his father. And they uh, moved about 100 miles and bought a different farm that uh, was in a new, completely new territory for them. And they bought it in the winter, which is a foolish thing to do. Uh, when the snow melted, they discovered that they had uh, mortgaged themselves to 80 acres of junk pile. The people who had left uh, the place had left everything behind in uh, every quantity and in every part of the fields and lawn and house. And so we spent years cleaning up after that mistake. and. Uh, and that risk ultimately paid off, but we paid dearly for it. So uh, yeah, that was an important part of my childhood. Hmm. It's also an important part of the poems in mm. Yellow Rocket, because that book deals with the theme of loss and ruin in many ways. It, what I love about it is that you, you find a way to redeem moments and people. And mm. even the farm that might not have been a wise choice becomes a wonderful venue for you to really connect with readers. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I guess I have a very optimistic view of heartbreak. Hmm. You know, whenever I've experienced it for myself and I've had my share, uh, I, I, I'm amazed at how things work out, not ever in the way that you think they will. Um, but they do work out, and that uh, sort of alchemy of life is really interesting to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that is a thread that runs throughout much of your life. And I think one of the interesting places in your personal history where that shows up is how and why you began writing poetry. Hmm. So would you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I dabbled in a lot of different forms, and it wasn't until uh, I was a freshman in college that I discovered that poetry could be useful in communicating with women. And so I started uh, writing poetry for women, one woman in particular who later became my wife, uh, who encouraged me uh, to take my poetry seriously and go get an MFA. And so the book is dedicated to her and uh, I've been writing poetry about and for and against my lovely wife for, you know, 20 years since then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hmm. It seems as though she was a good example of how things come together in your life that you may not have expected. Hmm. And we'll talk about that, especially in regard to how the book was published by Norton. But for the sake of viewers who are probably thinking, oh, wait a minute, how do we get from the farm to meeting his wife in college? So why don't we just go back for a moment and bridge that period? What were the things when you were growing up that helped you along your path to being a writer? Hmm. One of the biggest things was when I was 15 years old going to a theater camp that really changed my life. Um, I was part of a group of young kids that uh, got together to write their own original play and perform it in front of a huge pre-sold audience and it only was a week that we had to do this. So it was a trial by fire and it wasn't uh, until uh, we received our first standing ovation from that first audience that I realized that kids can come together and write something and move people, move their own peers, uh, and uh, that was really powerful. 
and um, I thought I would go into the theater when I went into college. Uh, and I tried it, but I'm not an actor, and I don't do uh, I don't do much uh, except write well. So learning the theater was kind of a trial, you know, a lot of error, a lot of trial and error. Um, and eventually I landed in the English department. And my wife is a French major, so we have language interests in common. And uh, one of the first things we would do together on, uh, most people were out on dates and off at parties, and we uh, would lie down on the floor together with a book between us and read plays. She would take parts and I would take other parts and we would re you know, read comedies and things. We thought that was big fun. And, uh, and those were, that's kind of how we fell in love, was uh, you know, reading those plays on the floor together. Hmm. Fabulous love story. <laughs> But at that point, playwriting really was your focus. And then you started writing poems for Amy, who would become your wife. At what point did you start to think, hmm, poetry is becoming more and more important to me? Hmm. <laughs> you know, I think it was just her encouragement, uh, telling me that an MFA would be a good idea. And so I applied to schools, and I got into the University of Alaska Anchorage. Anchorage and Alaska were places that she had always dreamed of going as well. So we spent two years up there, and, uh, and poetry was always kind of my first love. You know, my, uh, I, I hadn't really realized it, but, you know, my mom read us a lot of poetry on the farm. You know, cold winter nights we'd be complaining about something, or, you know, hot summer days we'd be in from the fields and thinking that our lives on the farm were, you know, crap and we hated it. And she'd bring out some poem that would sort of answer to whatever it was that we were complaining about. Mm. And, uh, they, you know, they weren't hard-hitting moral lessons. They were just um, strokes of beauty, moments of insight that would kind of turn us inward instead of, you know, being angry about our situations. And um, I think the fact that my parents relied so heavily, both my mom and dad were always moved whenever my mom would read a poem. Mm. Um, that, that, that was really, um, that was really inspirational to me, to know that my parents held poetry in such esteem. Hmm. So you are at the University of Alaska, and you're working on your MFA. And what were you thinking at that point? What were you hoping that would happen to you in the next few years? Where would poetry take you? Hmm. I guess I always dreamed I would just end up teaching and publish maybe a book someday, not with a major publisher, but a pretty minor one because that's the typical path, you know, you mm -hmm. publish with a couple of small presses and then maybe someday, you know, if you build up a body of work, a major publisher will get interested in you. Those were all very vague dreams, but I had other dreams of, you know, writing a novel and I still had my plays uh, in, you know, cooking in the back burner and uh, so I was kind of all over the place and um, when I got to, when I got back to Minneapolis, I took a job as an intern at the Utney Reader Magazine, you remember the Utney Magazine? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, a series of jobs that kind of let me do different editorial and writing kinds of things. Um, a, a public relations job, I was a flack for a little while and, you know, um, the poetry uh, kind of took a back burner uh, too, along with all the other creative writing for a while. And um, you know, that's a product of raising small children and having very little time to do the work. But I always came back to it and it was always something I had to find time to do eventually. And um, so, yeah, eventually I built up a body of work. Mm -hmm. But as you said, you thought that at some point you'd be published by a minor publisher, and that was not at all what happened. You ended up with the biggest mm -hmm. publisher out there. Mm -hmm. 
So tell us about that surprise. Yeah. I had submitted poetry to Poetry Magazine for about 15 years, and I, got, I have a little stack of rejections from those years. Uh, finally, they started publishing me about four or five years ago, and they fell hard for my work. Since then, mm -hmm. I've been in Poetry Magazine quite a lot. But in the beginning, when I first was appearing there, I suddenly got an email one day from Sherman Alexie out in Washington State who had taken an interest in my work, he said, and I'd never met him before, but he wanted to help me out. And did I have a manuscript? And did I know anyone in the publishing industry? And of course, I had a manuscript, and I didn't know anyone. Mm -hmm. And he introduced me to uh, the to W.W. W. Norton, who would become my publishers. And it was only... Um, a matter of a month or so before I had an offer. So um, it was rather uh, odd the way it happened. Um, during that month when they were considering the manuscript, um, a lot of magic happened. Uh, I sold my first poem to The New Yorker during that period. Um, I launched my website, uh, which was the, they, they found impressive. They liked how it, how it was playing out. And uh, they got a two-page letter from uh, a Pulitzer Prize winner who also was pulling for me at that time. So a lot of good things happened all at the same time. It was a kind of a perfect storm. Mm. And you have a great story about learning that Norton is going to take your book, and then you want to share the news with your wife, <laughs> and what happens? Well, when I got the email with the... Uh, with the um, book offer in it, uh, I was at work. And uh, I had to work that whole day. I worked at the Playwright Center, which is a, a theater organization. So I was, uh, had to work that day and into the evening f because there was a play in the theater. And so it wasn't until 10.30 that I got home. I had tried to call my wife with the news earlier, but she hadn't answered the phone. And by the time I got home, she was in bed. I woke her a little and I told her, hey, guess what, you know, something really cool happened. And she, she heard the news and she said, that's great, honey. And she rolled over and went back to sleep. And so I had this, I was just busting with this news and I, I had no one to tell. So I went downstairs and I sat on the couch and I opened my laptop and I, I Googled W.W. W. Norton and I looked at their website and I kind of explored all of their poets because I hadn't really research them yet, you know, this had all come kind of through the back door. And when I was sitting there reviewing the list of all the phenomenal names of poets who are published by W.W. W. Norton, you know, Poets Laureate and, you know, leaders of MFA programs around the country and editors of major journals, I just thought, wow, this is the company I'm in all of a sudden. And um, a euphoria overtook me. And I started giggling. And I didn't really have an object for my giggling. I couldn't tell you what exactly it was I was laughing about. But I didn't stop laughing for 20 or 25 minutes. Uh, and I've never had that experience before or since. But it was kind of a release after a really long day and 20 years of writing poetry in relative obscurity. And uh, I'll never forget that night. And so the next morning, your wife is now wide awake, and you tell her, and what happens? <laughs> Not much. <laughs> My wife is a very practical uh, uh, type, and she keeps me on a steady keel. So when she hears me come home with uh, crazy ideas or, uh, or wild news, she tends to, um, she tends to take it in stride and a uh, pretty steady keel with it. So. No, she was, she's not one to jump around and clap her hands. Mm -hmm. The good news didn't end with Norton accepting your book, though. When the book came out, it landed on the poetry bestseller list for several weeks, which is almost unheard of for a debut collection. How did that make you feel? Yeah, it was kind of surreal. A friend of mine saw my name there and told me about it. And then I, uh, he, he called me two weeks later and he said, you're still on the bestseller list. 
And then two weeks later, he called again, and he said, you, "You're on there again." Mm -hmm. uh, so um, that it was, you know, short-lived, but it was long-lived for a first poetry collection. Um, yeah, I don't, you know, I don't know. I think uh, I have had really good sales for the first book, this uh, this book, and um, I've uh, heard from a lot of fans. That's the other surprise that I had was that people reading my work tend to respond to it uh, directly to me, and they want to tell me, uh, you know, how it's moved them, which is more rewarding by far than anything else. Um, so. Um, that's been a real surprise too. Mm. Yeah. Now you told me on the ride over here that you see yourself as a connector, and when you were doing development work, that was certainly a big part of your role. When I look at your writing, I see he's a connector there as well because you help people connect to the moment you're writing about. You help people connect to the way words sound, the way they move, the way word pictures can have so much power and by doing that you also help readers connect to themselves and so I would say that that's part of why there has been such a, an outpouring of support hmm. for your work. Poetry, poetry r really makes me angry sometimes. When, mm. I read, when I read poetry, I tend to find that, by and large, it's very academic. It's written for an academic audience. It's written by academics. Poetry has sort of secluded itself uh, into the academy, and it's kind of landed there, and it's there to stay, I think. Um, there's the slam poetry movement, and there's uh, performance poetry, and there's all kinds of different kinds of poetry, but by and large, literary poetry uh, has kind of become siloed in the academy. Um, I'm not in the academy, um, and I write for people who aren't in the academy. Uh, when I write a poem, I don't think about myself as writer. I think about myself as reader. Uh, I'm really interested in how to write a poem that will catch my attention as a reader mm -hmm. and delight me as a reader. Um, and if it doesn't do that on the second read or weeks after I've written it or months after I've written it, then uh, it doesn't have a life. It gets put away in my folders mm -hmm. on my desktop mm -hmm. and it stays stays put away. So yeah, I think very much about the reader. The reader is important to me. I think that's another reason why the work is so strong because it feels as though you are speaking directly to the reader mm -hmm. and there is an authenticity about the work and a power to it that you just can't get if you are only thinking about yourself as the writer, but the reader is, is always there and I think people feel it and that's one of the reasons why they love the writing so much. Hmm. So we have time for one more question before I have you, you read mm -hmm. a poem. Okay. And I guess the question I would ask at this point is, okay, Norton publishes you you make it under the poetry bestseller list, and then they say they want to put the book out in paperback? Mm -hmm. That doesn't happen, except for big names, people with Pulitzers and huge reputations. How did that come about? You know, they just uh, emailed me and told me. Um, uh, and, and they also uh, emailed me at that point and said that they were going to release the book in London. Uh, and on four continents uh, abroad, which uh, is also feels like a great honor for a first-time poet. Um, when I when Norton took me on, they they uh, were clear with me that they didn't usually publish first-time mm -hmm. poets, mm -hmm. um, and for some reason they took a risk and and uh, and gambled on me. Um, so it's all gravy. I mean, uh, you know, I, I don't know how to stack it all up against anybody else's experience because um, for me, just having the work out there is, is exciting, but to have, you know, a major publisher and be abroad and have fans and all that is just, it's just icing on the cake. So I don't really know how to gauge it, really. I just can only feel lucky and, uh, you know, and thankful. Well, I'm glad that Norton took that risk, and we are almost out of time, so will you come back so that we can continue this conversation? I'd love to. Thank you.
Okay, and you're going to close with another poem. Yeah, I'll read a poem about my daughter, uh, Sophie, who's uh, 10 years old, but I wrote this when she was about seven. She was sitting in the back seat of my car and we were driving through uh, town in the morning and um, I wrote this about, uh, about wanting her to be happy in life. It's called, it's called My Joy Doubled. My joy doubled to drive my daughter through the jeweled morning light this morning. Joy to sigh, what a lovely morning, and see the glimmer in her eye in the rearview mirror as our light went green. And joy to show her how the ochre sunrise hadn't yet washed down from the cross on the steeple at the top of town. The temperature was three degrees, the bank sign said. Wake up, old Mr. Sun, we called as if he were our corner grocer, not the ember burling distant crowns. A mile we rode in silence, while the nickel purple crystal of the world was poured with light. I need to think she saw it all as it sped by, the rink in spun chain link, the outlet mall in mist and loved the pinks and golds as I do. She is so young. If I can't train her eyes to love, how else then praise the lapidary who cuts our days like diamonds from the carbon cold above? Mm, I love that poem. And I would bet any amount of money that what she's going to remember from that experience is wake up, Mr. Sun, <laughs> and not the cold. Has she heard that poem? Have you read it to her? You know, not really. She, it's been about two years since it came out or was since I wrote it. And uh, no, she, I, I kind of want her to discover it again one day when she's a little older. Yeah. She will. She <laughs> definitely will. Well, thank you so much for being here. It was a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.